Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series has been accredited for continuing medical education credit. The American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology is accredited by the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education to provide continuing medical education for physicians. Information about credit claiming for this and other episodes can be found at education.aaai.org forward slash podcasts. Credit claiming will be available for one year from the episode's original release date. Today, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Jay Lieberman, who is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Le Bonheur Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. Lieberman has had a very accomplished and productive research and academic career focused on food allergy and anaphylaxis. He is a current member of the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters, a co-author of the most recent 2015 Anaphylaxis Practice Parameter Update, and an associate editor for the Annals of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today, Dr. Lieberman has joined us and will be discussing anaphylaxis, which is a very important topic not only for allergists and their patients, but for medical professionals across all disciplines. I personally have nothing to disclose, and Dr. Lieberman discloses relationships with Kaleo and the Quest of Therapeutics and their materials products relating to epinephrine. Dr. Lieberman, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, and welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sukas, and thanks for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So this is going to be a, a great conversation. I know there's a lot of questions surrounding anaphylaxis, but let's just start with the actual term anaphylaxis, which can be really confusing for both patients as well as medical professionals. Can you tell us what this term actually means? Yeah, I can understand the confusion. It's confusing even for specialists within anaphylaxis. So hmm. I think to to understand it a little bit, we do have to go a little bit into the history. I hope it doesn't bore the listener too much. But we have to understand where the term came from. And it was initially coined um, by Paul Portier and Charles Richet when they were studying toxin in, uh, from the sea anemone and trying to develop an antidote. And what they found is instead of developing an antidote, they made the dogs they were studying more responsive to the toxin. They made them hyper-responsive. And so what they coined as a term, instead of being developing prophylaxis or protection to the toxin, they developed uh, something they called anaphylaxis. And so that was the first time that term was actually used, anaphylaxis, the opposite of prophylaxis or protection. And that was in the early 1900s. So since then, the term has been used to, to kind of describe various forms of a hypersensitive rea hypersensitivity reaction. And therein somewhat lies the problem of not understanding what it is because we don't have a very, very specific definition for anaphylaxis. So over the past hundred years, the term has been altered and changed uh, depending on kind of consensus definitions or criteria. And it remains today still a clinical diagnosis. So the definition is different depending on the society that, that, or the group of experts that makes the definition. In its easiest form, most people would describe it as an acute allergic or hypersensitivity reaction that can be serious and can lead to death. And that is a catch-all term, uh, but it's probably the easiest way to describe it. Oh, well, that's really fascinating. So it, it sounds... It's really interesting to hear you describe how it's sort of this vague catch-all term, and it can be applied however you like. And I think we'll get into some of the clinical criteria very soon. But let's go back to something you mentioned, because you mentioned that it can be life-threatening or cause death. Um, there's a lot of people out there that really equate this word anaphylaxis, meaning you're going to die. Um, but is that true, and are there different severities of anaphylaxis? Yes, sir. there's definitely different severities. Um, and usually, I think you're right, when people think anaphylaxis, they think 
oh my gosh, if I have anaphylaxis, I can die. And while that's true, it's, it's a, you know, not that common. And there are different grades of it, like you say. The problem is, is there's not one accepted criteria or grading system throughout a single country or even through the world. So there's various grading systems. And usually the, the experts who come up with the grading systems develop either a five-stage or a three-stage grading system, with one being a mild reaction. Sometimes that can be a local uh, severe or systemic aller allergic reaction, but it may only involve one organ system, for example, like hives and swelling due to an allergen may be a, a stage one anaphylaxis in some criteria where others would require two organ systems to be truly uh, an anaphylaxis event. Um, but no matter which one you look at, they all have a similar idea of stage one being a more mild form of anaphylaxis, and the higher the stage, whether it be a three-stage or a five-stage grading system, three or five-stage would be a much more severe reaction, and, and some would include death uh, as the final stage. And so it sounds like in general terms, if anybody were to use the term anaphylaxis or to use that as a, as a diagnosis, that you really can't apply that same um, degree of severity from one person to the next. Does that sound fair? Oh. I would completely agree with that, and and it just further adds to all the confusion. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you mentioned some of the specific symptoms. Um, can you take some time and actually describe for us the symptoms that are occurring during anaphylaxis and kind of what's happening inside the body that's causing those symptom, symptoms? And then after that, I'll, I'll, I'll pick your brain about the signals and mediators that are involved as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, clearly, no matter which kind of uh, cohort of anaphylaxis you look at, uh, the most common finding or symptom or sign of anaphylaxis is going to involve the skin. And typically, that's going to be described as hives or in uh, medical terminology as urticaria. Um, and that is often associated with swelling or angioedema. So, so the hives and swelling are clearly the most common uh, well, present, presenting finding of anaphylaxis. And then come the other findings, and they can be in really almost any organ system, to be honest, uh, the other common ones being gastrointestinal. And unfortunately, there's not one finding that's always involved. You can have vomiting. You can have severe abdominal pain or cramping. You can have diarrhea. Um, then there's the respiratory system, and that can be starting from the upper respiratory, so runny nose, congestion, like any type of an allergic finding that you would expect to see even with pollen, for example, um, down to the lower airways to wheezing, bronchoconstriction. Um, and the swelling can involve the, the airways as well, which can be scary to some patients. Um, the other organ systems would be the cardiovascular system, so at its, at its utmost form, uh, anaphylaxis uh, leads to shock, and it's pretty much the quintessential distributive shock, meaning you have overt uh, hypotension, leaking of the vessels and capillaries so that you can't maintain blood pressure. Um, and so it really can lead to protean manifestations throughout the entire body. Yeah, that's really fascinating that you know, this one condition can encompass so many different organ systems. So why is that? What are some of the chemicals and mediators that are impacting these different organ systems, and how does that sort of work on a on a cellular level? Yeah, so I think we know uh, at least some of the the mediators and, and some of the, the pathways. Um, the most well-described and understood pathway within anaphylaxis involves mast cells and basophils. And uh, in its most classic form, that would be IgE mediated. So meaning there is an allergen out there, such as a, a food protein, um, a protein within venom from a, a flying insect, for example, or a medication that will, um, in a susceptible person, it will bind these allergic antibodies, these IgE antibodies that can be sitting on mast cells or basophils. And when that happens, the mast cells and basophils get excited. Um, they will release um, numerous contents. And the one that's pretty much the most well-described and studied uh, is histamine. And so histamine has various effects throughout the body. And it's easiest to think about it as the mediator because we know a lot of its effects, such as on blood vessels, vasodilation leading to the swelling uh, can lead to the uh, hypotension in its most severe form. In the lungs, histamine can lead to bronchoconstriction. 
uh, which leads to wheezing and difficulty breathing. Uh, in the, the GI system, histamine can lead to contraction of smooth muscle and therefore the cramping or abdominal pain or vomiting or diarrhea that can occur with it. Um, it's not so simple as histamine is the only mediator and, and, and that's going to that's going to explain everything within uh, anaphylaxis, although it's a good model to explain a lot of the findings. Um, there are clearly various other mediators, both within mast cells and basophils and outside of mast cells and basophils. So, uh, for example, outside of them, we know there's activation of complement pathway as well as activation of the uh, kinin and kininogen pathway, the, the, um, the contact system. So there are various other aspects of the immune system being activated, although the mast cell basophil kind of model and picture is probably the most well understood and the easiest to understand, most well researched and the most easy to understand. Mm. Um, now, you, I like how you describe that these mast cells and basophils kind of get excited, especially if it's a, an IgE or allergic reaction that causes them to unload their contents. Can you give us a sense of like timing of onset? So, you know, if somebody has a food allergy uh, and they accidentally eat their food, will those same cells get excited a day or two later, or is this going to happen much more rapidly? Yeah, what a great question. And so most of what we know suggests that um, – Using that pathway, the IgE-mediated pathway, it's kind of known uh, in immunology as the immediate-type hypersensitivity. An immediate-type meaning, typically meaning seconds and minutes up to hours. So what would happen in a classic reaction would be if the food is ingested, the symptoms will typically occur if it's local symptoms, such as itching in the mouth, within seconds to minutes. If the food is then gets digested and have to travel to other parts of the body, you would see that in minutes to maybe up to an hour or two. But with other forms of, of anaphylaxis, it could be even quicker. So, for example, if you're stung, that is injected directly into the body, so the reaction may even occur even quicker than, uh, than up to an hour. Um, there's one, there's one um, kind of well-quoted study um, that looked at anaphylaxis and the time to onset of severe symptoms, and it was quickest for iatrogenic or, or medication-induced or if it was, for example, an allergy shot given that caused the reaction, that was the quickest, and that was within minutes. And then venom was next within 15 to 20 minutes, and then foods a little longer, 30 to 45 minutes to the onset of the severe uh, symptoms. So people really need to focus on a time frame within hours, not days. Yes, and I tell all my patients, if, if you're experiencing, for example, hives, and it's a day later, it's very rarely going to be the allergen or anaphylactic event. The only caveat to that, I would say, is we do know there's something called biphasic anaphylaxis. So that's where you would have the initial reaction, which is severe, and the symptoms completely resolve with treatment, and then may come back hours to even a day later, so it would be a recurrence of that one-time event. That's pretty rare as far as anaphylactic events go, um, but that would be the only caveat to if you have symptoms a day later, probably is not going to be anaphylaxis. Gotcha. So um, you mentioned that the, this biphasic occurrence where you have anaphylaxis, it resolves and comes back again is a pretty rare phenomenon. But how about anaphylaxis in general? Is this something that you know is pretty common and, and can it affect anybody of any age, children and adults? Definitely can infect uh, anyone of any age. Um, you know, there are studies that try to pinpoint how often, you know, how prevalent it is. I usually quote that if you live in the, in the United States or North America, a lifetime prevalence of probably somewhere between 1 or 2%. So 1 in 50 to 1 in 100 people who are born in the North America probably will experience anaphylaxis sometime within their life. Wow. Um, is there any way to identify those people as soon as they're born so that they can kind of uh, <laughs> be on the lookout? <laughs> I wish if I could develop Batman, I'd probably be a rich man. Yeah, we'll have you back on if you ever do. <laughs> <laughs> um, you already mentioned some of them, but I'd love to have you kind of summarize and recap about the, the most common causes of anaphylaxis, because I think there's a lot of misconceptions uh, from both medical professionals and patients as well. So what, what do people need to you know be aware of? Yeah, so... Um, common causes of anaphylaxis, and the most common causes that you would see would be foods, drugs, and insects such as venoms from fire ant or wasp or yellow jacket, for example. Now, 
it does depend on your age group and and this is true whether you live in you know Europe or the or North America that children who experience anaphylaxis almost it's always going to be due to a food and if the younger they are that becomes almost 100% so if you look at case series or cohorts of anaphylaxis whether it be Europe or North America and you look at children under the 2 years of age almost 100% of causes are due to food almost now, as people get older, adolescents, you start introducing other causes such as venom, such as medications. And interestingly, in the adult and geriatric population, foods go way down as causes. And usually the most common cause, if identified, is a drug. Now, in adults also, in many case series, the most common cause is not identified. So we call it idiopathic. And when I'm talking to patients, I use the the idea of saying we're idiots and that's why we call it idiopathic because we mm. can't figure out what the cause is. Um, but idiopathic anaphylaxis is, is definitely a common cause amongst older adults and geriatric population. Um, now, if I may, kind of, these are some big sort of areas. Do all foods cause anaphylaxis or are there select foods that are more likely going to cause anaphylaxis? Yeah, there's definitely select foods. There's some geographic variance in the foods depending on where you live and which foods are are common. Um, but clearly we know that in, in, in younger infants, uh, milk, egg, nuts, including peanut, seafood are common triggers. Um, in some younger infants, soy and wheat are also included. So, um, you know, the classic, what we call the big eight allergens, and that's somewhat based on um, based on cases of anaphylaxis, what are the common triggers and also what are common foods as well. And then now it's important because in our country, the FDA has required labeling of the big eight allergens uh, in food products. So those would be the milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, fish, and shellfish. And so that would be the most common triggers. Sesame is another one that's starting to be more common and we're seeing more in, the, in North America especially. Um, and so those would be the major food allergens. So, for example, when a patient comes to me and they're telling me my kid has allergic reactions to red dye, I'll typically say that's probably not going to be a true allergy. Um, but I'm I'm more likely to to entertain the idea that if the kid reacts to you know peanut or cashew, it's going to be more likely to be a true trigger uh, rather than some um, very uh, rare food such as the, like I say, red dye is a common one that gets brought up to me. Mm, okay. um, and then, oh, sorry, with the insects, it would be things like yellow jacket, bee, wasp, and if you live in the right part of the country, uh, fire ant. Okay, so we're not really talking about like mosquitoes or spiders or things like that. Yeah, so very rarely is it described that mosquitoes or spiders lead to anaphylaxis. And I often have to tell patients that, you know, it's it's a common response to develop itching, swelling, et cetera, for mosquito bites it's very, very, very uncommon to develop a, sy a systemic or severe or life-threatening type of allergy to that. Oh, great. And then with medications, there, I mean, this is a broad range of different things we're talking about. Or is it more antibiotics or is it more people who are undergoing surgeries? Uh, can you comment more on that? Yeah, so exactly. Those are probably two of the largest groups of medications that are implicated in anaphylaxis. So on the inpatient side, um, it's, it's uh, around the time of surgery. And so there are a lot of uh, anesthet anesthetic agents that are associated with anaphylaxis uh, in that setting. On the outpatient setting, we see referrals and you know cases and cohorts uh, described of anaphylaxis more commonly uh, to antibiotics. Now that being said, any medication pretty much can cause anaphylaxis, but those would be the two larger groups that you see more often. Okay. Now, now that you've described, you know, some of the more common causes, can you also comment on routes of exposure as in regards to triggering anaphylaxis and likelihoods? Um, you know, there's always a lot of concern of if you have an allergy to a food or medication or, you know, say a venom or something like that, uh, just being in the same room or uh, inhaling it, is that the same risk or rubbing on the skin as if it's actually injected in the body or eaten? Yeah, we, we see it all the time. And so, the, the idea, the science is, is you have to have the protein interact with the body, 
So the inter the we think, at least as best we know, the protein has to interact with that IgE antibody, the allergic antibody, to lead to all the downstream events. So when we think of the protein, it's hard for most proteins to be aerosolized. So meaning if I open up that bag of peanuts and I try to detect peanut protein in the air, there's very, very little. And if there's any, it settles on the ground very quickly because the protein just falls to the ground. So true anaphylactic reactions to aerosolized proteins uh, in the form of foods is pretty rare. So but the route of exposure can be anything theoretically as long as the protein is, is, is exposed to the body. And the way it's exposed may, as we talked about earlier, may lead to how uh, severe or quickly the symptoms will onset. So if I take peanut protein in a peanut allergic patient, and I would never do this, but if I injected an IV into somebody, that would lead to a very quick, very severe reaction, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's the protein that matters. It's just very rare for food proteins to be aerosolized in everyday uh, regular activities. Okay, that's great. And the same thing with like medications. Do we have the same risk from you know all the medications that we can rub on the skin for various reasons? Is that the same risk as if it were injected or, or ingested? Yeah, it's pretty rare for topical medications to lead to a systemic reaction. It would have to be a breakdown in the skin to allow that mm. uh, that molecule to be able to ex be exposed in high enough amounts to lead to that severe reaction. Okay, great. Well, yeah, I, you've done a fantastic job of really breaking down the common causes of anaphylaxis as well as what's going on inside the body. What do we know in regards to, you know, the recognition from medical professionals? Is, is this something that emergency room physicians or emergency responders, uh, you know, recognize very easily, or does this seem to be misdiagnosed on a regular basis? I think it's been a, a constant uh, trouble and effort to try to Im improve uh, recognition of anaphylaxis. And, um, you know, there's, there's been various criteria to establish to try to help um, say anaphylaxis may be present or is likely to be present if, if there are various scenarios or clinical criteria. And with the idea being that if these are there, it's reasonable to treat this case as anaphylaxis. You know, it's, it's very hard on the, on the front lines for emergency room doctors also who see a lot of people coming in. And for example, if they come in just with hives and swelling, it's very hard right at that moment for the, the emergency room doctor just to, to try to figure out, is this anaphylaxis and therefore is this life-threatening and do I need to treat this aggressively or is this typical hives and swelling and it's not going to progress? So it's, it's very hard um, for them. Now the clinical criteria that was established in the United States uh, from the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease use clinical criteria to try to say if, if these are present, you know, anaphylaxis is probably there. And those criteria are pretty good at saying if they're present, anaphylaxis may be there, but those criteria are not perfect because if those criteria are met, very often it may be something else. So mm -hmm. it's not ideal, unfortunately. Now, do you have any tips on, you know, what do you, what do you tell patients or, or other providers when you're providing education? What do you, is there some easy way to distinguish or, you know, err on the side of caution? Yeah. So I personally say, you know, there are two main things, obviously, is, is if you know you're at risk for anaphylaxis because you have an allergy to X, Y, or Z, the obvious thing to say is avoid it. Don't get into situations, if possible, where, you, you know, you'll have the event. Now, sometimes that is not possible or you don't even know the cause, in which case I say if the symptoms are concerning to you at all and you're worried, then err on the side of caution like you were saying and treat it. And that would get into the treatment that I think we'll talk about, but obviously the treatment is, uh, first line treatment is epinephrine. So I err, always say err on the side of caution, treat it as, as anaphylaxis, and in the worst case scenario, you've overtreated, but there's very little downside to that. Mm, okay. Um, and have you actually seen patients have anaphylaxis with your own eyes? Absolutely. And it can be frightening when it's a severe case. Mm. And in your experience, do you, does it tend to be the same sort of uh, situation with every patient? Or have you found that it's highly variable based upon a whole bunch of factors? I, highly variable. And, you know, some patients... They're, they're feeling fine, and then two minutes later, they're covered in hives, and they're having trouble breathing, and they look a little shaky and diaphoretic, 
and that you, you can tell that that you know in, in just in the general sense wow something is wrong going on here and then some patients will have a little slower progression they'll have a few hives develop and then they may vomit and then they say they're feeling bad and so it's a little slower but all of them you know and you take it all into account we need to be a little bit you know probably even for myself be a little more aggressive in, in managing it and, and probably not waiting for it to get to the next step Mm. Yeah, I think that speaks volumes as somebody as experienced as yourself, and you know, you witness this, and you you understand this better than anybody, and yet um, you know, it's so highly variable of, of what you're seeing. I I understand why it's a daunting thing for people to try to diagnose clinically. Now, uh, you talked about the clinical criteria, but is there an easy test that anybody can order? Is there a blood test or uh, any other diagnostic test that can prove that this is anaphylaxis, either you know while it's happening or after the fact? Yeah, so this is kind of, in some ways, the holy grail for anaphylaxis because we don't have a good diagnostic test, right? I think in a perfect world, we'd have a point-of-care test that you can run and get back within a minute or two and say, this is a allergic reaction that could be severe or could be life-threatening, and we need to treat it as such. So the most common test people will use is something called a, a serum tryptase, um, this is uh, something that is released from uh, mast cells and will increase in, in the bloodstream uh, during uh, um, allergic reactions. The problem is it's not always elevated to patients having allergic reactions. Um, dogma says that it's not going to be elevated in cases, for example, of, of food-induced anaphylaxis. Um, it doesn't come up, it doesn't increase in the bloodstream right away. It takes, um, you know, on average, 60 to 90 minutes to, to reach its peak and to be uh, highly elevated. Um, the other problem is it can be elevated in patients, um, but not above kind of the um, lab cutoff of an elevated level. So most labs use an elevated level, for example, of 11.4, but you can have a patient as a baseline of two, and if they go from two to 10, that's probably clinically relevant. Mm -hmm. But if you just use the standard marker of what's elevated based on the lab, it would say that it's not elevated. So uh, a serum tryptase is a thing we often tell patients to say, if you present, you know, with symptoms of anaphylaxis in the emergency room, it may be worth checking while, if possible, and I'll often give patients a prescription to say, please draw a serum tryptase if I present uh, with symptoms, you know, uh, that's concerning for anaphylaxis. And I'll compare that to their baseline when they're not having symptoms to see if I, do I believe that this is a mast cell mediated event um, but it's not an ideal test, unfortunately. Is there some uh, time frame in which you, the tryptase is more accurate as opposed to not yeah, accurate? Yeah, probably in most in most series when you, you actually measure it um, from from the time of onset, probably starts to to, to rise above elevated levels at, at about 30 minutes, peaks around 90 minutes, and then is gone. Um, you know, uh, 120 to uh, maybe 150 minutes after that in most patients. So it's definitely time sensitive, which makes it even harder. Sure. Uh, so not very helpful if you're seeing somebody the next day or, or a week later. No, but I'll tell you, you know, you know, there's always cases that may be different. So I tell, tell you know, trainees and other physicians that it's worth checking because I've checked it in a patient, you know, a day later and was off the charts uh, a day after the initial um, presentation because it can be helpful even 24 hours later. I just would not expect it to be elevated. Mm, okay. Um, and, you know, you spend a lot of time talking about how histamine is a major player in, in a lot of, you know, what's going on throughout the body during anaphylaxis. Is that something that we can easily measure? Histamine um, peaks sooner, so maybe 20 to 30 minutes after the, the, the incident. It's a little harder to measure as well, um, so it's, it becomes clinically less uh, relevant or clinically less uh, – it's harder to, to measure and use as a marker. Uh, some people have reported the use of a 24-hour uh, urine histamine metabolite, so you can measure a histamine metabolite in the urine, and you'd have to collect that over 24 hours uh, and then measure it. So I don't find that personally clinically helpful most of the time, although it can be measured, um, just just not typically used. No, oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, now let's go back to a really important concept that you, you introduced previously. Uh, tell us, how should we be treating anaphylaxis? Yeah, so treatment in every guideline, no matter where you live or when it was published, is going to be the same. First line treatment is epinephrine, um, and uh, it's it's mainly the only therapy 
all other therapies are adjuvant therapies. So we always counsel patients to say, if you're at risk, you need to have epinephrine available um, in some form. And unfortunately, as of right now, the only way we can deliver epinephrine um, is parenterally or through, you know, we have to inject it. So typically we inject it into the muscle. So we recommend intramuscular injection of epinephrine and um, to repeat that if the symptoms are not improved. And it can be repeated in five minutes or 10 minutes. It doesn't really matter. There's no contraindication to delivering epinephrine IM. And, you know, we're using doses that are much lower than what we use um, for, for example, you know, CPR and resuscitation. Mm, okay. Uh, so it, I always just make sure patients understand that, that the therapy is epinephrine. There's no downside to using it. If after using the epinephrine, you want to, you know, treat with antihistamines, that's fine, but that is not the primary treatment for anaphylaxis. Uh, what about steroids? Steroids, once again, are also not the primary treatment. Um, there will be, you know, this has been looked at in, in, in various reviews, and there doesn't seem to be any therapeutic benefit to steroids. Um, that being said, I, you know, I know how, pra how medicine is practiced, and, you know, I can't deny that if I were in the emergency room and someone comes in uh, looking like they're in anaphylaxis, the idea of throwing the kitchen sink at them seems very appealing. So, um, you know, they're often used, but there's very little evidence to say they have any role in treatment of anaphylaxis. Mm. Um, now, wait, does it matter what the trigger is for anaphylaxis in regards to epinephrine? Like, does it work better if it's caused by, you know, venom versus food or anything like that? Yeah, we don't know that for sure, to be honest with you. There are some case series looking at, for example, patients who um, died due to their anaphylaxis. And one of the, the things about them is when, for example, in some of the case series, when they looked at, at patients who died of food-induced anaphylaxis, um, there was some suggestion that, that uh, asthma was a risk factor and bronchoconstriction led to um, the fatality and therefore treatment with a short-acting beta agonist or a bronchodilator may be beneficial to do in addition to the epinephrine, but there's no, we, we don't know if epinephrine works better in one uh, cause of anaphylaxis versus the other. So always better just to use it um, regardless, correct? Absolutely. And can you tell us why it's so effective? What What's special about epinephrine compared to antihistamines or steroids or things like that in regards to anaphylaxis? Yeah, so the way I tell it to patients is epinephrine is essentially a natural uh, hormone, right? So it's a shot of adrenaline. And I tell my patients, especially the younger ones, that feeling you get, you know, before a big game or before a big test, mm -hmm. that you're having probably an increased re release of, of adrenaline or epinephrine. What it does is it is it counteracts all the negative effects that, that we think are harmful with anaphylaxis, meaning so if bronchoconstriction is one of the major uh, causes of death with anaphylaxis, epinephrine reverses that bronchoconstriction. It bronchodilates and actually used to be used in asthma. So epinephrine, it, it counteracts the vasodilation or the drop in blood pressure. It, it constricts blood vessels. So it it counteracts that part of it. It increases the heart rate and how and how hard the heart is beating. So it increases circulation. So it really counteracts all of the life-threatening aspects of anaphylaxis. Hmm. How fast does it work? Onset is with it was within minutes, but the problem is it is also gone within minutes. So mm -hmm. that's why it's important that if if we feel like you you've got a dose of epinephrine. And after even a minute or two, we feel like, you know what, you're no better. There's no real downside of giving a second dose of epinephrine at the doses we're talking about. Okay. And is there one particular, you mentioned using it in the muscle. Uh, any? Is there one particular muscle that's recommended compared to others? Yeah. So right now, all recommendations are to give it into the outer thigh muscle, uh, the vastus lateralis muscle. Now, that's based on, on one study that showed that the absorption of epinephrine was higher if you gave it through the thigh than if you gave it through the elbow. Um, there's, there's not much data beyond that to, 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 um, to agree with that or say that, you know, uh, that there's even a better way if, that we haven't tried yet. But based on that study, mo all guidelines currently agree that epinephrine should be administered in the outer thigh muscle. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned safety and, um, you know, uh, 
that's why we want to use it because it's not going to cause major side effects. But I know there's a lot of fear surrounding use of epinephrine from both medical professionals as well as patients. Um, part of it has to do with it being a needle and an injection, but also concern about side effects. Can you comment on some of the common misconceptions that you hear and, and then also kind of, uh, you know, bust those myths and tell us what the truth actually is? Yeah, my, I think my favorite misconception, all thanks to Quentin Tarantino, is that <laughs> epinephrine has to be injected right into the heart, right, uh, from the from Pulp Fiction. Um, so epinephrine, you know, it's going to get throughout your system, honestly, no matter where you inject it. And, and in severe cases of anaphylaxis, actually, um, it's recommended that epinephrine be given by an IV drip, so straight into the bloodstream. Mm. Um, so it, it doesn't it, 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 you know, it, it's not dangerous to be given uh, in any in any form or in any way, and we know that because we do get IV epinephrine. That obviously should be monitored. Um, but I think that's the main, the, the most common misconception is, oh, I have to, you know, inject it in a certain place. The other misconception uh, is that it's going to um, lead to something that they can't even imagine, like, oh, my heart's going to burst or <laughs> my heart's going to beat so fast, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to have a heart attack or something like that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no evidence to that whatsoever. At the doses we use, the physiologic changes uh, really aren't, aren't, um, aren't huge. It's really just reversing any negative effects from the anaphylaxis. And when we advise patients to seek emergency care after they give epinephrine, is that because, uh, you know, it's a dangerous thing to use or because the needle is huge or what are the reasons that we recommend they, they be monitored? Yeah, that, and, and that stems mainly from if the reaction is severe and you felt your child or yourself that you needed epinephrine, then you need to be monitored to make sure that the symptoms are not going to progress. Right, because your epinephrine, even if you have a, a two pack of auto injectable epinephrine, that is quick onset, like we talked about, but quick off. So within minutes, that is already worn off. So the idea of being evaluated is mainly to say, let's make sure that this is truly resolving. Let's make sure your blood pressure is okay, your oxygen levels are okay, uh, and it has nothing absolutely to do with this because we're worried that epinephrine has any side effects. Okay. Have you ever injected yourself accidentally or on purpose with an epinephrine auto injector? I will. I will admit to doing it on purpose on numerous occasions, <sighs> mainly when I have worrisome or I have, I have pediatric patients or adolescent patients who, when the thought of injecting themselves with epinephrine scares them. For example, I'll walk into the room with an epinephrine auto injector in my hand, and literally, I've had kids go physically walk to the corner because that they are now scared of it. Mm. And so in, in patients like that, I will actually self inject epinephrine on occasion to show them, look, it's no big deal. It doesn't hurt. Nothing's happening to me. My heart isn't beating out of my chest. Um, and it's not a dangerous thing. What does it feel like? Uh, you want to know the truth? I don't really feel anything when it, when I do it. <laughs> I've had other people who have done it also, healthy people. They say they get a little bit jittery. Uh, I've never really felt that jitteriness. I've hooked myself up to a monitor too also, and there's a minimal change uh, in, in, in blood pressure or heart rate uh, that yeah, I don't think is worrisome at all. Okay. Uh, and once again, for our listeners, uh, we don't recommend that you try this at home. <laughs> this, is, this is purely Dr. Lieberman's experience. I, I accidentally injected myself one time. I thought it was a training device, but it was a, a live device. Um, and, you know, it was, it was weird. It, I didn't feel anything either. I, I was kind of excited, actually, because I had always wanted to do it. So, uh, <laughs> but no, it, it, you're right. It, 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 it's really kind of um, underwhelming, to be honest with you. You couldn't immediately jump, leap over tall buildings? Uh, no, I should have tried, however. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, let's go back to uh, aftercare or management and prevention and things like that. So which patients should be prescribed an epinephrine auto-injector? Is there some rule of thumb or, you know, is there any guidance in that realm? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a little bit practitioner dependent, but, I mean, any patient who we truly believe is at risk for anaphylaxis, is at risk for a severe life-threatening reaction, uh, should have uh, epinephrine uh, available on hand. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, in, in, in current times, that means an auto-injectable epinephrine, and there are some rare cases in which patients would, you know, have a vial, and I've even seen on YouTube people making up their own 
um, epinephrine injection kits that they then carry. Um, that's, you know, obviously not recommended uh, from a safety aspect. Um, but, uh, you know, I think anyone who has potential for a life-threatening reaction should have epinephrine available. Okay. Um, and let's go back a little bit to the fatalities from anaphylaxis. Do we have any idea in regards to how common it is for someone to die from anaphylaxis? Yeah, there's there's a lot of different uh, reports. Well, here's what the one thing I'll say. It's it's very rare that someone dies from anaphylaxis. And it's also very rare even if you have a known allergy, for example, a known food allergy, you are much more likely to die obviously from a car accident. And so what I tell patients to say is that you are taking as much risk getting into the car every day as you are, you know, going into a restaurant. So you just take the proper precautions. We don't get into a car, drive 100 miles an hour down a crowded street without a seatbelt. We, you know, we drive close to the speed limit or under the speed limit, we wear a seatbelt. And so if you have a food allergy, for example, you read labels, you ask you know, the, the waiter at the, the restaurant about the dish you're ordering, you carry your epinephrine and have that available. You take the proper precautions. And if you do that, you can really minimize your risk. Mm. Um, now, you know, this has been a fascinating conversation on many levels, but to, to kind of summarize, this is a good point, or a good point to do so. You mentioned that anaphylaxis is a heterogeneous condition. It can have variable presentations, including severity, some being very mild, some being more severe. Uh, you've also mentioned that um, fatalities are rare, and but it's also common. So, you know, up to one in a hundred are at risk to develop it at some point in their lifetime. Does everybody um, have the same risk for dying from it, or have we learned anything from um, prior cases in the literature in regards to some common themes that to that places some people at greater risk from dying from anaphylaxis compared to others? Yeah, I, there's a couple of themes that come up. And in, in, in the food allergy world, it appears that if you have underlying asthma, uh, and we have talked briefly about it before, but if you have underlying asthma, that seems to be a pretty decent risk factor um, for um, more severe reactions. Um, and then, you know, risk-taking behavior, as we know, is a risk factor, right? So, and this is commonly seen in adolescents. They don't want to carry their epinephrine with them. They don't want to tell other people at the party that they're allergic to things, so maybe they'll, they'll eat something and take a little more risk than they, than they should have. Um, so, so asthma, I think, is a risk factor based on my reading of the literature. Uh, risk-taking behaviors, obviously. Um, and then the route of exposure. So, you know, in, in inpatient or, you know, perioperative anaphylaxis, if something is given IV, like I talked about before, it's, it's probably more likely to lead to a more severe reaction. Mm, okay. Now, can anybody ever, you know, outgrow their risk for anaphylaxis or does it magically go away over time in people? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a great question because, you know, we don't really know. People we know outgrow some food allergies, for example. Um, and we know that, you know, labeling, if you're labeled with penicillin allergy, for example, we know people outgrow that. The question is, were these patients truly allergic to begin with? Um, and, you know, the testing just got improved over time. Um, you know, for the majority of patients, and we know that, for example, milk and egg allergy are outgrown uh, much more commonly than other allergies like peanut and, and seafood allergy. Um, but usually, if you're allergic to something, it, a lot of the times that's going to be lifelong, and the risk theoretically then would be lifelong. Mm, okay. Now, I, I just have a couple more questions, but I, as we're talking here, um, it dawned upon me that you know I'd love to get your opinion on some of the more esoteric and rare forms of anaphylaxis. If you could just briefly comment on, say, you know, uh, red meat anaphylaxis or exercise-induced anaphylaxis. Uh, what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, so the, the red meat anaphylaxis is, is a great story that's evolved over the last 20 years um, in which, it, it, you know, as best we know, it, you know, the, the idea is that patients who have a history of tick exposures, and not all patients who have a history of tick bites, but in some certain patients who are, uh, for whatever reason, at risk for it, who um, get bitten by ticks, develop antibodies to a certain chemical called alpha-gal. It's a sugar that sits on the protein um, in, in mammalian meats. And uh, for whatever reason, it's not quite clear yet, this is the one, the one exception with anaphylaxis in which 
um, for food allergy that you eat the food and the symptoms don't typically occur within minutes, rather they occur within hours, with an average onset for most patients around four to six hours. So it's the one case in which we say this is a delayed, um, a delayed anaphylaxis uh, with, with food allergy. Okay. And then for, for the exercise anaphylaxis, that's an evolving uh, area of understanding because we know there's different types of exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So some patients, you know, who can just go out running can get covered in hives, develop shortness of breath, and have true anaphylaxis, whereas others require cofactors. And the common ones implicated include foods such as uh, uh, wheat, um, and uh, the other common uh, cofactor include uh, medications such as NSAIDs or aspirin. And so when you add the two together, the NSAIDs and the exercise, you can reproduce symptoms in these patients. But if you do one without the other, you can't reproduce symptoms. Um, so the exercise-induced anaphylaxis is a, a nice evolving area of research where we're starting to understand it a little bit better. Oh, boy, that's fascinating. Um, so along those lines, the, the last question I have for you is, you know, especially for the medical professionals who are listening uh, to our conversation, are there areas surrounding anaphylaxis, diagnosis, or management that you feel we need to improve upon, whether it's, you know, out in practice or in regards to research and better understanding? Um, there, there's a lot that we need for research. I think the, for me, the holy grail would be one diagnostic marker or criteria. Ideally, you would have a physiologic marker that you could do or a test that you could say, this is anaphylaxis. And for practitioners, I think we all need to understand that epinephrine is not dangerous. We need to use it earlier within reactions and not be scared of it. I think some of that would improve if we had non-injectable forms of epinephrine. I think for whatever reason, that barrier of injecting a medicine uh, is, is one that both patients and practitioners have. And if you had a non-injectable form, I, I hope that that barrier would be overcome. And um, in presentation, to, to recognize it as an entity more often, even if the patient doesn't have a life-threatening case. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah, Dr. Lieberman, I, I really can't thank you enough for your time and for joining us today. This was an outstanding conversation. We covered a lot of ground, um, and I know that it would, it's going to be very useful for those who are listening in. Um, but before we say goodbye, is there anything else you'd like to add? I just wanted to say thanks for having me on. It was enjoyable. Yeah, it's our pleasure. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Information about credit claiming for this and other episodes can be found at www.education.aaaai.org forward slash podcasts. Credit claiming will be available for one year from the episode's original release date. Please visit www.aaaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.